Okay, as I mentioned before, this is the radiation uh, heat transfer numerical problem out of chapter 13. Um, it's a rectangular box. The dimensions are given. I've identified the front surface is A3, the top is A2, the right hand side is A5, and the other surfaces are defined there on the sheet. Give you the emissivities of all six surfaces. Give you the temperature of five surfaces and surface six is re-radiating. And I've calculated the F's for you for three different ones, F12, F13, F15. Okay, so here's what you do. The first thing you do is verify those three F values I gave you by getting whatever you need, X over Y, X over Z, go to graph number so-and-so, and show me that that number is correct. Okay, so verify those three F values. Okay, then we start with the A, B, C answers. There are five unknown J values. Okay. It says, uh, says write an equation for each of the nodes for which J is unknown. There are five nodes where J is unknown. Down below it says hint. For part A, use equations 1321 and 1322 of the textbook. Equation, we had both those equations in our, in our notes. Okay. 1321 is the equation you, you use where the temperature of the node is known. Equation 1322 is the nodal equation where the heat flux is known at the node. So depending on what's given, if the temperature node's given, use equation 1321. If the heat flux in the node's given, use equation 1322. So write those equations out. They'll be in terms of J, 1 through J5. The unknowns of those five equations will be J1 through J5. Solve those by whatever means you want, what you did last time for the first one, maybe, maybe um, MATLAB, maybe Excel. It's going to be pretty simple, a five by five matrix. TI-89, TI-92, whatever it might be. Put on, the, on your, on your uh, homework what you use to solve those uh, equations. If you used Excel or MATLAB, give me a hard copy printout of the results. Attach it to the back of this. So give me a, a hard copy printout of that. Uh, solve for the five unknown J's. Then put the J's in for the equations to get what? Part C to get Q4, Q3, 5, and the temperature of the adiabatic surface. Surface 6, the temperature of the adiabatic surface. Okay. So that is then due a week from today. Any questions on that right now? Okay. Now let's go ahead and take a look at where we left off last time. We're in chapter seven, okay. Last time we were looking at how we get H for a flat plate. So the flat plate like this, it might be part laminar, it might be part turbulent. There's a critical X value where transition may occur. The Reynolds number for that critical transition is 500,000, five times 10 to the fifth. That's external flow over the simplest possible geometry which is a flat plate. Now we take the next most popular geometry. Um, obviously we engineers use a lot of tubes and pipes. So now we want to know how do we find the H value over pipes and tubes. What it amounts to is a circular cylinder. So this is a circular cylinder. Okay, its dimension into the blackboard is L, so it's like a pipe, a pipe of length L. The diameter of the pipe, the outside diameter is capital D, outside diameter. Now we have to go back and revisit ME312 a little bit, not much, just a little bit. In ME312, we analyzed the flow over a right circular cylinder from a fluid mechanics point of view. 
here's what we kind of said. Approaching flow stream, free stream velocity, U infinity. The stream line here, the dashed line, ends up at this big black dot. That's called the stagnation point at the front of the cylinder. Stagnation point means that the velocity there is zero. Okay, then, of course, the flow goes around the cylinder like this. It speeds up as it goes around the cylinder. Uh, <clears throat> because the velocity is zero at the leading edge or the, the, the frontal point on the cylinder, a boundary layer builds up. A laminar boundary layer builds up. So we have a laminar boundary layer built up around the cylinder. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, it's, what happens is we call it the separation point. It separates from the cylinder and goes off like that. So these are the flow stream lines. And again, this is our boundary layer. It's a laminar boundary layer. On the back side of the cylinder, it breaks off and goes like this. And behind the cylinder is a region called the wake region. Turbulent eddies form in the wake region, like little circular patterns of velocity. You can get a really good view of that if you go to a stream, a fast moving stream, and there's a rock in the middle of the stream, about the size of a watermelon or something, and, and, and the water goes around that rock. On the back side of that rock, there'll be little circular eddies, and there'll be leaves and bugs floating back there in circles. Boy, they're just going in circles behind there. Yeah, that's the wake region behind a rock and a stream. But it happens whether it's air, or water, whatever. There's a wake region typically behind, behind here. Um, it depends on the Reynolds number. If the Reynolds number is really low, okay, then the sep uh, this point, by the way, is called the separation point. It's where the streamline separates. It's caused by a pressure gradient, but that was, that was MB312. We're not gonna revisit that in detail. Um, what happens uh, at, at this particular case, or low Reynolds number, the separation point is way back on the back side of the cylinder. As the Reynolds number increases, the separation point moves towards the front side of the cylinder, eventually ending up about here. At that point, at that Reynolds number, something dramatic happens. The flow transits to turbulent. There's a turbulent part. It's laminar for part of the way, and then it goes turbulent at, like this. So the dashed line is a turbulent part. Just like over here, it starts out laminar, and at a certain Reynolds number, it transits to a turbulent boundary layer. The same thing around a circular cylinder. It starts off as a laminar boundary layer, as the Reynolds number gets higher, eventually the boundary layer, this is the laminar boundary layer, this is the turbulent boundary layer, and then the separation point goes back to the backside because of momentum consideration. The fluid particles close to the surface when the flow goes turbulent pick up momentum. The momentum causes them to continue following the surface until again the pressure difference uh, builds up and they fly off. All right, that's the fluid mechanics case, but again, you can't do the heat transfer part until you understand the fluid mechanics part. Okay, so now our object, though, is to get H in ME415 because we want to find the heat transfer Q, and Q is equal to H bar AS TS minus T infinity, assuming the surface is hot and the free stream is cold. So the temperature of the surface, we call that TS, it's the same all the way around the cylinder. TS is constant all around the cylinder. Okay, so obviously, let, let's, let's, give, let's give AS first. What, what is AS? AS is a surface area. What is AS? It's the area of the circular cylinder that is in contact with the fluid. 
okay, pi dl, pi dl, circumference times length, pi dl. Okay, obviously, ME 415, we got to find that guy. That's what chapter seven is all about. Over here, what's the challenge? We got to find these two guys. Need those two guys. Local heat flux or the heat transfer over the surface. Okay, um, over there, a lot of it was um, mathematical by nature. Um, over here, not, not much mathematical by nature. The way that you get this guy here is typically by evolving what we call empirical equations. They call them empirical correlations. Mean, that means they're derived from experimental observations. Derived from experimental observations. And the first one we have is, uh, let's call it one. By the way, the bar over H means it's the average value. The average over what? Well, the answer is the average over the cylinder surface. In reality, H varies from the front, theta equals zero, theta equals 45, theta is 90. From the front to the back of the cylinder, H will vary. So the bar means averaged over all angles theta. Okay. So Nussault D bar C Reynolds D M Prandtl to the one third. That's the empirical correlation. Uh, let's put these guys down. Reynolds number based on <coughs> diameter D, U infinity. D over nu, Nussault based on D, that's the bar, H bar D over K. So now we base the Reynolds and the Nussault on the outside diameter, D, capital D. Flat plate, we base the Reynolds and Nussault on the distance X, the distance from the leading edge of the plate. Okay, uh, this is called the Hilpert equation. Just so we know uh, let's see if we got it here. I don't have the equation number down right now, but it's the uh, first equation you come to in that uh, part of chapter seven. Uh, properties at T film, which is T surface plus T infinity divided by two. Uh, the values of C and M are constants. And the values are given in table 7, 2. And table 7, 2 looks something like this. I'll just put one down there. Um, let's see where table 7, 2 is here. There it is. Uh, I'll do 4,000 to 40,000. There's different ranges here. 4,000 to 40,000. I'll put another one down. One of them goes from 40 to 4,000. Uh, that value, 4,000 to 40,000, uh, yeah. 0.193 and 0.618. 618. Okay. So that's what you do. You, again, here's a no salt number. There's the H bar you want. 
You solve for the no salt number, get the number one, get the Reynolds number. Is there any magic Reynolds number? No. Over here, a flat plate, is there a magic Reynolds number? Yeah, five times 10 to the fifth. Over here, no. It might be a laminar boundary layer. It might be a combination of laminar turbulent boundary layer. But there's no magic Reynolds number that you have to always focus on. So put the Reynolds number in here. Get all the properties. What properties? The Prandtl number, kinematic viscosity, thermal conductivity. At what temperature? The film temperature, TF, film temperature. The boundary layer is considered to be a film or a layer of fluid, the film temperature. Okay, these guys came from uh, where? Experimental observations. Okay, there's another possible equation to use. This is two. Uh, this one is no salt number. It looks very similar, Reynolds D to the M, but now there's a Prandtl to the nth power and then a ratio Prandtl number to the one-fourth. Okay, uh, if the Prandtl number greater than or equal to 10, uh, greater than 10, N is 0.36, if Prandtl less than or equal to 10, that should be a 10. Then N is 0.37. Properties at T infinity, except Prandtl S at T surface. C and M are in table 7-4. And it's called the uh, Zoukakis equation. Then the Churchill equation. Our, our, our textbook gives three different equations to find h-bar. Most books give you one, but our, our textbook, our author is really complete, so he uh, gives you three possibilities. This equation, um, I'll just put a few things down. Properties at T-film, uh, no table needed. Um, which is the good part of it. You don't need a table. In all these guys, you've got to satisfy some Prandtl number restrictions. So you check the restrictions. The Prandtl number might, should be greater than something, or the Reynolds number should be greater than something. So you check the restrictions. On this guy right here, um, there are no important restrictions. I think the Prandtl greater than 0.6 is the only one. So, but you, you always check, always check and see if there are restrictions on these equations. Uh, how did someone get these equations? Because sometimes it's like magic, like, okay, I'll use it, but I really don't know where it came from. I'm just a user. I, I don't worry about where it came from. But some people worry about where it comes from. Like, how, how'd that guy get that table right there? Okay, well, here's one way that, that, that you can do that. If you, um, I'm going to, I'll tell you, it's example 7-3, seven, seven, example 7-3. Um, there's a wind tunnel, and uh, they put in the wind tunnel a circular cylinder. Diameter of that cylinder is D. Its length is L into the blackboard, sticks out blackboard, L. And uh, the wind tunnel creates a nice even flow like this. I 
several years ago, I had a student in class, and after class was over, she came by my office and said, Professor Biddle, um, I'm doing a senior, I'm thinking about a senior project. I was looking at that example, 7-3, in the textbook, she said, is it possible I can do my senior project uh, based on that example? And I said, well, yeah, I think you can try. Um, yeah, go ahead and give it a try. So what she did, we, we have a small wind tunnel in the fluids lab. It really belongs to um, technology department, but we, we used, at, at that time we used it. And it was only about, I think, 12 inches this way, uh, out of the blackboard this way, 12 inches, and maybe this way, 10 inches. Um, and so she was going to use that wind tunnel. And uh, she got an aluminum cylinder. I think it was like, it was 12 inches long. Must have been, yeah, four inches in diameter. 12 inches long piece of aluminum, four inches in diameter, solid aluminum. Okay. She drilled a hole through the aluminum, axial hole, through the aluminum, and then she stuck this cartridge heater, electric cartridge heater, inside of the hole. It made a really tight fit and put some special heat transfer uh, uh, enhancer in there. So this cylinder's in here, and then you attach this thing to a power supply, a watt meter, put a watt meter in the circuit, and this is the input power in watts, of course. Okay, so you heat the cylinder that way. Solid aluminum, drill a hole through it, insert the cartridge heater, and then attach it to a power supply and put a watt meter in line. Then, well, here's what she needed to do. She needed to get the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number, based on diameter, U infinity D over nu. Okay, got the diameter, four inches. I'll get the properties later. Uh, U infinity, go back to uh, ME313 lab, fluids lab. We have an HVAC duct in that lab. We have students measure the velocity of the air in that HVAC duct in that lab to get a velocity profile in that rectangular duct. Very similar. So what did she do? She took the pitot-static tube that we used in the 313 lab, and she put the pitot-static tube in the duct at the center line. And that gave her U infinity. Okay. Then she inserted a thermocouple in the line that gave T infinity, thermocouple, digital readout. We have that all throughout, throughout the fluids lab. Then she attached to the outside of the cylinder, she attached thermocouples. How many? She, took, she attached four, one to the front side, one to the back side, and one 90 degrees. And that gave her T surface, digital meter output, thermocouple, transducer. Okay, and then she varied the velocity U infinity over a range 10 times, 10 different velocities. Gave her 10 different Reynolds numbers. Multiply the velocity from the pitot-static tube by the diameter, divide by kinematic viscosity at what temperature? The film temperature, average TS. Why do you put three thermocouples on? because the temperature around the cylinder won't be the same. They'll be close, but not the same. Aluminum's a good conductor of heat. They should be close, but not the same. So you average those three temperatures. Okay. Now you want to find um, the uh, Nussault number by definition. Nussault bar means the average is H bar D over K. Get K at the film temperature. Got it. For air. Diameter. Okay, four inches, four divided by 12. Um, now, the H bar, how do you get H bar? Well, you go back to chapter one. For convection heat transfer, Newton's law of cooling, Q equal H bar A S T S minus T infinity. I measure T S, thermocouple, average them. I measure T infinity, got it. Uh, the surface A S pi D L, got it, got it. I have the watt meter, tells me the input power, got it. Solve for H bar. Get no salt bar. All right, now I've got it. So now I've got the Reynolds number and the no salt number. Now, of course, first of all, 
the person that did this experimentation and getting away from the senior project now, but who came up with something like this? Well, I'll tell you who did. The guy that he probably took ME312, okay? ME312, we say, you know, if you run an experimental program and you want to plot the results, you can just be random and plot anything against anything. I think I'll plot U infinity versus um, the K value. Bad choice. Uh, I, I think I'll plot the uh, U infinity uh, versus uh, the uh, uh, diameter. I'll change the diameter. No, bad choice. We tell you in ME312 there's something called dimensional analysis. They say, if the heat transfer is a function of these different parameters, you can put them together in dimensionless parameters, and that's a major hint of what you, the experimenter, should do in a laboratory environment to plot your data, your results. Uh, okay, if you do that with, with all these parameters, you, you take H and, and D and the properties K and nu and U infinity, Forget this guy. This guy is not serious. Forget him right now. Then what pops out? The important dimensionless parameters are the Nussault and Reynolds numbers. Okay. What does that tell me? If you make a plot from your experimental data, the first thing you should try and do is plot Nussault versus Reynolds. Okay. That's why engineers know that that's called the form of the equation I expect. It's called a power law variation. Power law. So I would plot, and she did for a senior project, she plotted on here, the salt bar and the Reynolds number. And she had 12, 10 different velocities, so she had 10 different Reynolds numbers. I'll just show you a few of them here. I'll just say that's the range. And I'll just make it up based on that 40, here's 40. Here's uh, 4,000, and by the way, if you're going to try and do a correlation, a power law, the best thing you want to do is plot that data on log-log paper, because if you plot it on log-log paper, and it correlates, you're going to get a straight line, a straight line. If it's a power law, you'll get a straight line. Look at that data. I say, I don't think that's a straight line. <laughs> I don't think that's a power law variation. I guess my results are all really miserable. I feel bad my senior project failed. I'm going to go home and cry. Yeah, right. No, no, not exactly. You say to yourself, you know what? If I want to be real tricky, uh, those points there almost form a straight line. Look at them. And um, those points right there almost form a straight line. Look at them. So, what do you do? So, you know what? I'll fit that curve piecemeal to a bunch of straight lines. And then I'll tell you, the user, what to choose for C and M for that equation. That's what they do. For instance, 4,000 to 40,000. Now, we tell our freshmen and early classes, we have them do log log plots sometimes. We say, okay, uh, if you want to find the value of C, go to that graph with the Reynolds number one. Okay, put one in there. Reynolds, forget the panel number now. Reynolds 1. Raise it to any power you want. I don't care. Raise 1 to any power you want. What do you get? 1. 1. What's the value of C? The value of the new assault number where the Reynolds is equal to 1. Okay. You go over here between 4,000 and 40,000. Go back to where the, on your log log graph where the Reynolds is 1. Oh. There's the value of C, 0.193. Got it. And then what's M? M is the slope. Take a ruler off if you want. You can take a ruler out. Centimeters. Measure the slope of that line. That slope would come out to be, with the ruler, for instance, make it real easy on yourself, 0.618. So that's what these guys do who put together these empirical equations. They get a hint on what to plot from dimensional analysis, then they make their plot and try to fit it into a power law if they can, if they can. You know. 
So, and it's nothing new. Now, let me tell you something, okay? If she would repeat this with a different diameter, let's say she doubled the diameter to, to um, eight, eight inches. Here's her data points. She says, you know what? I'm going to put this thing in a water channel down in the fluids lab down there, the, the civil engineering water channel. I'll put it in there, and I'm going to measure that with, with water now, not air, water. You know, guess what? Conclusion, it doesn't matter what the fluid is. It doesn't matter what the diameter is. It doesn't matter what the temperature is within bounds. All my data falls on the same line. Oh, you know that from ME312. That's what we beat into in ME312. It doesn't matter how you change these things. Uh, if you've got the right parameters from your uh, dimensional analysis, they're going to all plot on the same line. I'll tell you something else. Here's a Reynolds number. Here's the friction factor. Here's 2,000. Get the Reynolds number. This is for water. This is for air. This is for oil. You know what? It doesn't matter what the fluid is. It doesn't matter what the, what the diameter of the pipe is. I get all my data points on the same line. Wow, is that amazing? Yeah, but not really. It, it, it comes from dimensional analysis. What are the important dimensional parameters in the Moody chart? This guy's dimensionless, F. This guy's dimensionless, Reynolds number. This guy's dimension, no salt. This guy's dimensionless, Reynolds number. The power of dimensional analysis for engineers. It is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Is there a special Moody chart for water, one for air, one for oil? No, 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 no. The same chart, one piece of paper, one piece of paper for everything in the world. Wow. Power? You got it, man. Power. Same thing here. We know what to plot. So, just so you know, sometimes people say, I'll use it, but I don't know where it came from. There's where it came from, okay? And we had a senior project that did this. Now, her answers were accurate to these numbers here within 25%. Pretty phenomenal for Cal Poly versus Cal, Caltech or Stanford, okay? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty good. So, 25%, I thought, good job. You know, you did, you did a good job on that senior project. But yeah, uh-huh, she took an idea out of a textbook and based her senior project on that idea. Okay, now, let's talk a little bit more. Anything about that right now? Okay, let's talk a little bit more about these equations. Now, you say, um, you know, it looks kind of strange there. Um, if I use equations one and three, um, properties of T-film, but be careful, be real careful. That guy right there, ah, ha, ha, properties at T-infinity, shift gears, big note on your, no, not on your equation sheet for the exam, because on the exam, only one you're going to use, that's why I boxed it, the only one you're going to use on, in this course for an exam situation is that boxed equation, okay, that way you don't have to worry about that. Well, but why are they different? How come you shift gears in the middle? Well, dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. He says, if you use my equation, who's Mr. Who, who's that? Mr. Zukakis, Russian scientist, okay? If you use my equation, base your properties at T infinity, except where you see that Prandtl S, that S means at the surface temperature. Why did he do that? Just because he do, you know, doesn't like other people? No. He found his data correlated better when he did that. His experimental data correlated better. So he said, okay, that boxed equation is based on properties of T infinity. Dealer's choice. He took the data. He tells you what properties to use. Okay. Why are there three? I mean, a lot of textbooks only give you um, one, one equation. Our author, this textbook is so thorough. They give you three Three equations here. Um, this one is, you don't need a table, which is nice for, for computer code. You don't need to go into a table. Uh, you, you can, one equation covers everything. But it's, it's a complex equation. So for our homework and, and exams, no, no. Before I forget it, well, I'll go and continue this first. Why are there three? Okay, 19, this, this, if you check the references at the back of the chapter, 
This, is, this was uh, published in 1977. This was published in uh, 1972. This was published in, really? Before World War II? My gosh almighty. Jeez. You know, 67, 77, 5, 80, 82 years ago? Oh my gosh, it's still in the textbooks? Yeah. Why? Well, it's so simple, that's why. It, this has a little more complexity here to it, you know. Now, that was a simple one. But when that guy took experimental data, what did they have? I'll tell you one thing. They didn't have the, the handheld calculators. They didn't have the laptops. They had slide rules. Slide rules. They didn't have the sophisticated instrumentation we have today. So these numbers here, oh, they're suspicious. Uh, you know, they're, they're suspicious. I mean, it's risky. You wouldn't want to use that equation in the real world. No. No. These two guys here say, okay, this textbook, this edition, 2011 maybe, I think it is. I checked the front cover. 2011. 11 plus 23, 33, 34 years ago. 34 years ago. Both these guys, roughly. Well, where's the equation uh, 2008? <laughs> no, it's not in the book. How about an equation for 2001? No, it's not in the book. 1993, sorry, it's not there. What does that tell you? I guess I'll do a search, you know. I'll do a search and see if I find one. But if I can't find a newer one, I've got to use this guy right here. He's the latest one, probably the best instrumentation. Why isn't there a later one? Well, one good reason maybe, and this is a maybe, okay, in order to do this research program and do a good one, you need lots of money, lots of money. You need a couple technicians, at least two or three technicians. You need a couple people to analyze the data and report back to you. Oh, you need a staff of about five plus yourself. You pay them, you pay for lab space. I got a wind tunnel here, wow. You lock it up for three weeks, a wind tunnel, wow. Maybe, maybe millions of dollars, probably millions of dollars nowadays. Well, what, 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 how come they could do it? Well, I'll tell you something. If you want to put a man on the moon, you don't want to use a 1933 data instrumentation. Uh-uh. I'll put a man on the moon. I want the latest and the greatest. So I better get new H values. And by the way, there was something called the Cold War then. Oh, it was, it was in full blowing, man. It was full blowing. Tons of money dumped into who? Our money. DOD? Yes. Tons of money dumped in the space program? Who? NASA? Us. Yeah, they dumped tons of money in to get the latest and the greatest. They didn't want to depend on pre-World War II instrumentation. No. Slide rule era. Oh my gosh, no. No. Since then? Uh, Toyota says, all right, um, we, need, we need to get some H data on this for something. What are you going to use? The guy says, well, I'll tell you, boss, either I can use this 1977 data, that's the last one I found, or I can do a, a new research program for you for $1.2 The boss says, you know what, let's just use that one. That's okay. Yeah, unless you find money, you don't do the work. That's part of the, the way we work in this world. If nobody pays you, you don't do the work. So there better be a darn good reason to spend a lot of money to do the work. Oh, depends what you want to do, you know. Obviously, <laughs> they said that's good enough. That's good enough. And I'll read you what it says in the book. The reader is cautioned that all these correlations are only valid within 20% accuracy. Ah, that's a big, that's a big one right there. They're only valid in 20% accuracy. Wow, wow. Why is that? Well, uh, let's go, first of all, it's experimental. So you got experimental uncertainty. Experimental uncertainty. If you minimize that, then what else is there? Okay. This guy right here, for, I'll, I'll just give you for instance, this guy right here. You know how hard it is to get that thing to be uniform profile? You do it in a wind tunnel. Do you think you're accurate on the 10 freeway has that? 
approaching the, the grill? I don't think so. You think it's coming straight towards you? I don't think so, not most of the time. So very seldom, very rarely, do you have a uniform profile that looks like that approaching your radiator, because your radiator has circular tubes with air going over them. A heat exchanger has circular tubes with maybe steam going over them. So right away, is that steam perfectly like that? Oh my gosh, no. Do you see those heat exchangers? They go like this. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, over the tubes. So yeah, that's why that uncertainty is 20%. Just so the, the reader knows, be cautious. Because don't, think you, don't carry your answers out to eight places accuracy on your, on your uh, TI-1050 model. It's ridiculous. What, what accuracy better you should be on your spreadsheet? How about three significant figures? Nothing more. Nothing more than that. So, yeah, be aware of that, okay? So, the bottom line in our class, we're using this guy. Even though he's outdated, we're using him. You get the idea how to find the H values. Problem is, for homework, he uses different equations for different problems. So, the answers, if you use pick and choose, you might be off because he used this and you use that or whatever. So I'm going to tell you now what you should use to get the answers for homework so you, your answers may match his answers. All right, chapter 7, problem 745, uh, 745, I'm sorry, 747, uh, 747. Use Hilpert and you should get his answer. Problem 749. He used Churchill, but I don't want you to use Churchill because it's too complicated for what we're doing. We're going to use Hilpert. So the answer for H bar or whatever you might get, Q, will not match his answer. Will not match the author's answer. Seven, problem 749. Use Hilpert no matter what. Problem 753, he used equation 744, so we're okay. That's Hilpert. Problem 753, don't do part C. We didn't discuss fin effectiveness. We discussed fin efficiency, not fin effectiveness. So don't do part C. 753. Uh, That's the only three problems on this stuff. Now, all right, now all this leads up to how about non circular? Non circular tubes and pipes. Well, there's a lot of tubes in the real world that are non circular. Look at your automotive radiator. They're not round tubes carrying water. Look at them sometime. Uh, so to do that, we use Hilpert. Again, these are empirical correlations from experimental programs. We use That with table 7-3. Okay, here's table 7-3. Geometry. Reynolds number C and M. Okay, so it, uh, the first one, non-circular is a square tube with the pointed part facing forward. <coughs> this is dimension D. A uh, square tube with the flat part facing forward. This is dimension D. There's five different pictures given. I'll show you three. A hexagon shaped tube. with the flat pointing forward. And uh, then they give you, I'll just give you one here, a Reynolds number range 5,000 to 60,000. Then they give you a value of C, 0.158 and 0.66. And there's two more pictures given there. 
So you use the Hilpert equation right here, and if you want the C and the M, you go over here to get the C and the M. It's very straightforward. It's the only thing you can do. It's the only choice you've got in the textbook is to use Hilpert with that. This data here was taken much later than Hilpert equation data, so this is more updated data for C and M here. You say, well, what if my Reynolds number is 80,000? Go on the internet, good luck. It's probably out there somewhere, you gotta search it. These are the most popular Reynolds number ranges. Okay, question back there? Oh, um, why don't they like update the table? This one right here? Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good point, that's a good point. Uh, I, I suspect that, that this one is updated and what they do, this guy here, I didn't put it on, this accounts for property variations. But when they did this one, when they, when they did this correlation, they did use newer instrumentation. So yeah, I, I think this one supersedes that. It's, look at that form, look at that form. They're identical except for that property variation. And what if it's air? 0.7 divided by 0.72 raised to power, one fourth power. Nothing, close to one. Okay, so uh, I think that's why they, it has been updated, but it's been updated and extended to its usefulness, yeah. Um, okay, now, over here, just so you know, Reynolds number, and the salt number. D, obviously, does not stand for diameter. What's the diameter of a hexagon? No, don't ask a question. There is none. D does not stand for diameter. It stands for dimension or distance. Take your choice. Dimension or distance. What is D in these pictures of this tube? It's the distance from the uppermost point to the lowermost point. Top to bottom. Top to bottom here. Top to bottom here. Top to bottom here. That's how they define the Reynolds number and the Nussalt number. There's nothing magic about that dimension in the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is U is a velocity, okay, a velocity times some dimension divided by a property. Oh, what dimension? Well, if it's a flat plate, the dimension is X. If it's a circular tube, the dimension is D, the diameter. If it's a non-circular tube, it's the distance from the top to the bottom of what the air sees. Here's the air approaching here. What I see in front of me, this tube here, is that distance, top to bottom. When they do, I tell my 312 class, when they do, let's say, drag force studies on a, on a NASCAR or a top fuel dragster, or a funny car typically, John, John Force Racing in Orange County, um, they, they plot the drag force as a function of the Reynolds number. If you're, the, they've put motorcycles in wind tunnels, full-size motorcycles in wind tunnels, with a rider on it, and change the speed in the wind tunnel, and get different, different Reynolds numbers, and they get different drag forces on there. Well, when they do that for, uh, let's say, a funny car in drag racing, what do you think they're going to find D as? The, the, the headlight diameter? No, I don't think so. The wheel diameter? Why? It's got to be something. I don't know. Maybe the dimensions of John Force's head? I don't think so. You got to, you I don't know. What should I choose? What should I choose? Well, what they choose? Here it goes. The distance that the air sees from the bottom to the top of the car. You face the car, frontal and you measure the distance from the wheels on the ground to the top of the funny car. And that's how they get the Reynolds number. The motorcycle rider, you measure the distance D, the distance from the tires on the ground to the top of the guy's helmet on his head. Metrolink train, you measure the distance D from the railroad tracks to the top of the Metrolink engine. A tractor trailer truck with the tractor in front and the trailer behind, look at it head on, and to get the Reynolds number of that truck at 60 miles an hour on the freeway, you take the distance D from the tires on the ground of the, of the tractor to the top of the trailer, top of the trailer. That's the dimension D you put in the Reynolds number to get the Reynolds number of the truck going 60 miles an hour on the 10 freeway. 
So it, it, that's the choice you make. What should, I, what should I put in for this dimension D in the Reynolds number? Whatever makes sense to you, whatever makes good common sense to you, okay? All right, so just so you know how you handle these guys right here, okay? Um, for instance, I could put, I could put a, a square tube like this, a square, it's really a fin. There's a fin, I attach a fin to a heated surface to take heat out. I attach a fin to a heated surface. This could be electronics package. I want to take heat out. I put 100 fins like that on this thing and blow air over it. Okay, what do I do? Okay, right here. I use, I use that equation in the box. I use this for D, which is this dimension right here, if it's square. I put it in here. I get H bar. I put the H bar in here. I get Q. That's the heat loss by what? By one fin. Multiply it by 100. I get the heat loss by 100 fins plus the base area, the heat loss out of the base area here too. So that's how I use stuff like that, okay? It, it can be a fin or it could be a tube carrying water with steam blowing over it, whatever. These guys right here are condenser tubes. And it could possibly, I'm just giving an example, condenser tubes. Steam hits them, cold water inside. The cold water condenses the steam. The steam drops off, goes to the hot well. That's how we engineers analyze these things like this. Okay, ah, good stopping point. We've finished chapter seven. Okay, I'll do an example on Friday for you. But we're through with that right now. And let me go pass out the, uh, the uh, second exams for you.